Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. All right. Hey, everybody. Uh, welcome, and uh, thanks for joining us today as we talk about uh, an experiment in uh, social gaming that uh, we uh, em embarked upon this year with, uh, in partnership with the Skype team. Uh, I'm really pleased to talk about this. Uh, we had an amazing time. We had uh, um, some tremendous support for some, uh, some great engineers in the Skype group uh, who helped us to bring this thing to reality. Our goal was to, uh, to uh, instill slavish devotion to the Skype brand, um, and in that we succeeded, t to me, because I've decided now that I wear entirely Skype colors from now on. Um, I, well, I'm committed now, in, 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 for love of Ishii, to wear Skype colors for the rest of the day. And, uh, and including my wristband. Uh, but you'll, you'll learn more about kind of what I'm talking about uh, soon when I hand this over to, to Abhiman Sham. He's my intern. Uh, he is a graduate student at uh, University of Southern California. He's um, working on his MFA in interactive media and games. Uh, he brings uh, to Microsoft a, a really strong blend of industry and academic experience. And uh, he's worked on some really cool projects in the past. Uh, he's just recently did an internship at BMW, uh, working on augmented reality games for their car lines and all kinds of other stuff, um, which he'll get into in more detail. So without further ado, uh, I will hand it over to him. Thanks, Savvyman. Thanks, Donald. Uh, thank you all for coming. Uh, I'll be presenting, as Donald mentioned, about Ishii, uh, which is a social game for the Skype team. Uh, so just to give you all some background uh, of my background, um, before coming to USC, I was a playwright and director, uh, theatrical director by night, and a software developer and journalist by day. Uh, and at USC, as Donald mentioned, uh, I was part of the Mobile and Environmental Media Lab, which explores um, putting interactive experiences in buildings and cars. And I went on to further do some of that work at BMW last summer. Um, and I also helped. Uh, found and lead the World Building Media Lab, which is Alex McDowell's lab. Alex McDowell is the production designer of such films as Fight Club and Minority Report. Um, and this lab was kind of exploring uh, a future medium somewhere between game and film. Um, so that's some of my background before coming here to Microsoft. Um, so to get started, um, our main goal here uh, for my internship, if I could put it into one question is, can we embed a meaningful game in the newly opened Skype buildings? Um, and we'll get into what it means to have a meaningful game in a second. Uh, but just to give you some background on to why we were looking at the Skype buildings uh, for this, um, Ross Smith, um, who is director of tests there, um, had um, an initiative that he called Signal Hill that was kind of the, uh, the forerunner for this event. And um, Signal Hill, if you don't know the background of that name, was the point in Newfoundland where Marconi had the first transatlantic communication. Um, so uh, Ross really wanted these new buildings, uh, which are five and six here on the Redmond campus, um, to actually, as the buildings, be interactive experiences. So the buildings as community organizers, the buildings as facilitators of employee health and initiatives. Um, so that they would actually have these different personas, which he uh, dubbed Ingrid and Ingmar, um, which apparently had no reference to the Bergmans. But there you go. Um, so these buildings um, in this premise would be able to help you help facilitate your day. Um, they would learn more about you. Um, they could potentially bring you into small interactive experiences in some of the new innovative spaces that they had in the buildings. Um, so here's one of their, uh, what they call an alt space uh, in the buildings, which is like a congregation collaboration area. And um, additionally, it could uh, help maybe be gamified in a way of um, incentivizing you to some healthy activities. Um, so those were kind of the backgrounds from Ross's perspective of uh, health games and using the buildings as um, a conduit for those experiences. Uh, and additionally, 
uh, as these buildings were getting open, uh, Skype had some very specific branding that they wanted to do, you know, which at Redmond had to do with uh, retro Mariner shirts and tattoos, obviously. And um, I don't know, they had a very specific, uh, cult they wanted to bring in culture shock. Well, that was a big thing that they talked about, culture of innovation. Um, and so they had some very specific ideas about what they wanted these new buildings to be, uh, which was an open office that was very different than what was there before. Um, so kind of look at what our over top level initiatives were. This was at the beginning of the summer before the experience started. Um, we wanted to engage employees in a healthier lifestyle, make the workplace not feel like a place of work. Um, we really wanted to bring together employees that would otherwise not interact on a day-to-day -day basis, uh, which was pretty big because um, with Skype and Link coming together in these buildings, um, they're, from some of the just basic uh, demographic interviews that we did before our design, we found that there were a lot of people that didn't necessarily interact with people in their neighborhood or uh, between buildings or had any idea who these other people were. And considering that they were working on products that were becoming more and more integrated, we wanted to find ways um, through our game design to get that to happen. Um, and we just, like we said, these buildings have this very specific branding, and we wanted to help people learn about those. Um, so a very brief primer of games and game design, not to get into it too much, but just a little bit as to why something like this is important. Um, so on a very formal level, um, this is like a very uh, objective way of approaching a game. It's a closed formal system that brings about conflict and looks to have some kind of resolution to that conflict. Um, and another way to, and so th just really quickly, this, is, uh, this quote comes from Tracy Fullerton, who's my professor at University of Southern California, and literally wrote the book on game design. Uh, this is, if you want to know more about game design and get into it, I heartily recommend this book and following Tracy. Uh, and this quote comes from Bernard Suits, The Grasshopper, which is to say that playing as a game is a voluntary attempt to overcome unnecessary obstacles, uh, which is an important thing to think about because a lot of games, if you stripped away the context of the game, are actually um, things that you wouldn't really want to do in your real life uh, if they were your job. If you think about SimCity, you're essentially a resource manager uh, without the objective of the game. Um, so we are willingly allow ourselves to play in these experiences because it allows us to try out different things in that space. Um, so the way that I see it, the things on a basic level, if you're thinking about games, games have a goal, games have rules, they give you feedback on your play, and they're voluntary, so you opt in and out. So if we just look at soccer, the goal of the game is to win. Uh, the rules are different things. You can't foul people. Uh, you have two 45-minute halves, et cetera. You have feedback, so you, everybody knows when a goal is scored. And if you don't enjoy soccer, well, you can just leave the game. <laughs> um, and then just kind of to capstone on this, so people play games for very different reasons. And um, for example, if you guys know the board game Settlers of Catan, uh, my wife and I, when we play, have very different reasons that we play. She, all she wants to do is trade with other people and interact and have this social experience. And uh, I'm much more interested in being cloak and dagger and winning the game. People like to win. People like to play. People like to interact. Um, they get into this flow state um, for various reasons. And that's an important thing to consider when you're um, designing a game. Because ultimately, your game design uh, reinforces whatever desired behavior you want. Uh, as a game designer, you need to think about what you want players to do and what players want to do and how those uh, overlap. Because between those two things is where you get a game that people will want to play and you'll be proud of and will create that behavior that you like. Um, so even a much, much briefer primer of ARGs, which was kind of the original impetus uh, when Donald uh, brought me aboard, was to create an alternate reality game for the Skype buildings. Um, so uh, an ARG stands for an alternate reality game, if you all don't know what that is. And actually, um, interestingly enough, uh, ARGs kind of have their uh, origin here at Microsoft. Um, so right here, uh, this is a poster for AI, which came out in 2001. And um, there was an ARG started with it called The Beast by Jordan Weissman uh, and some others. 
And uh, in the credits, really, there was a really small line of somebody's name that said that she was a sentient technology specialist, I believe was the term. And so people would Google this person, and then they would start to unlock, they would find all of this crazy information, and they unlocked this really crazy puzzle about a bizarre murder mystery. And uh, they, I think they had like 3 million players, and they got a ton of press for it. So, and then I Love Bees is a similar one that came out, I believe, with Halo 2, um, which they had like the trailer for Halo 2, and then there was this really quick little I Love Bees URL that was bleeped at the end of it, and people started to explore this really crazy fake website and this uh, history behind it. So the idea of an alternate reality game is kind of um, an embedded narrative that is kind of not of this world, but in this world that people can engage with. Uh, and it's used, uh, it's been used a lot uh, as a marketing tool or kind of a different way to get into, get people engaged. Um, and traditionally, although it's called an alternate reality game, it usually has to do with puzzles. It's all, I would call it an alternate reality puzzle. So a lot of embedded narrative that you have to go through puzzles to uh, understand or to figure it all out. Um, and so that was different than what we really wanted to do ultimately because there's a big difference between games and puzzles. Puzzles are a part of games, but a puzzle always has a finite solution. And the goal of a puzzle is always to find the solution. Um, and the problem is, um, 10 years later, if somebody wanted to play The Beast or people wanted to play I Love Bees, well, it's all solved. When you look it up on the internet, that's all you get is the solution. So there really wasn't this option for multiple people to come in afterwards. It was one of the things, uh, a couple weeks into our design, you know, we had an initial way that we were going. And Donald asked me, he's like, well, is this something that could be replayed? Could we create this in a way that it could be done again and again, or the same people could play it again and again? And we were kind of initially going with this crazy ARG that uh, was based off of Ingrid and Ingmar, this crazy Scandinavian couple that had come to Seattle to be musicians. And we were going to embed all of this crazy narrative and these puzzles. Um, but we decided that the alternate reality game wasn't exactly what was going to be the most meaningful for the people uh, at Skype, and that we really did want to create something that would last. Um, so, uh, on that note, I'm going to play, this is a rough cut of some documentary footage that we've been shooting about what this whole experience is about. So hopefully that'll kind of clarify a little bit of where we're coming from and where we're going, and then we'll move on to some of the design and some of the results. Everybody's asking, what's the issue, what's the issue, what's the issue? Yeah. Ishii, well, I don't really know. Oh, let me think about this again. Ishii connects us. That's about all I know. Ishii is a kind of a collaborative game. It seems like some sort of research project to help us get better connected to each other. Uh, driving people to get up, move around, uh, interact. It's been working, it seems like. Yeah, there's been a lot of people I've met that I never would have met otherwise. Um, yeah, other than that, I don't know. There's been questions asked, so <laughs> they're going somewhere. I don't know. Rather than developing a narrative to embed in these buildings, we decided that we would create a mechanic, an experience, and a game that would create culture from the people in these buildings. Because ultimately, while we think that we want other people's stories, the stories that matter to people most are the ones that they create themselves and tell themselves and can tell other people. Microsoft has a long history of trying out new ideas on its own employees. We call it dog fooding. We believe we should eat our own dog food. And one of the ways that we do this uh, is by testing our own software. And we've been using games to test software for more than 10 years now. The, the, the incoming generation of, of, whether it's Microsoft or any, any employee, is coming from a background of, of gaming and social networking and digital technology. And so, it would be natural then for those, those tools and techniques to evolve into the workplace as well. We wanted our mechanics to focus on collaboration and communication, and we wanted there to be a low barrier of entry, and yet the game to feel rich, nuanced, and more complex as you went on. So the main mechanics that we focused on were connections, breakthroughs, and bolts. 
The connections mechanic was driven by the goal of getting people out of their seats. They would go as individuals to these kiosks or stations that we put across the two buildings. They would swipe their employee badge and potentially answer a few questions about themselves. Whenever I would get up and take a break to go get a drink, I would just make a loop through my floor. Um, we would actually usually do like two stations because if you go to get coffee, which you know we would normally do every day, you know us and some other guys from the team at the kitchen, there was two stations at. And I just planned a route. If I went to the bathroom or I went to get a drink or whatever, I would just purposely pass an Ishii station. Once the team had accrued enough connections, the next mechanic came in, which was the breakthrough mechanic. A breakthrough is a challenge that everybody on the team receives and must complete together in order for their team to level up and move on. These breakthroughs started out as very simple tasks, say just need one player at a specific station in order to level up. But as the game progressed, they became more complex over time. They needed people at different stations at the exact same time, uh, across buildings, two people at both stations in different buildings at the same time. They would have to start answering questions about their fellow teammates. Then they would have to find hidden objects in the buildings. Then they would have to start making media together. Are you guys on the challenge? Yes. <laughs> okay, wait, wait, wait. Okay, so I don't know what the... Oh, who's calling me? <laughs> Did you guys get the challenge? Oh. Yeah, we finally got it. We had Our final mechanic was bolts. Um, with connections and breakthroughs, ultimately people didn't really have any reason to think about other teams or the game at large. Bolts were ways that a team could interact with another team, um, either positively or negatively at their choosing. Um, but did you play a bolt? I did play a bolt. I played several bolts, I think. Two bolts today. And what were those bolts? I played, well that was the one bolt, and then the yeah. other bolt I played was a, a, bar a barrier just now I actually played a bolt. Uh -huh to block the Edisons. One of our big initiatives in creating this was to really foster collaboration and communication between people in these buildings, even if they don't know each other. I noticed structurally we're changing our communication style and interacting differently. Certainly, initially, we didn't even have to be a team. We could just be individuals doing tasks, but uh, that quickly changed. I think I got to know the co-workers in my room better and I actually socialized with them, whereas I did not before. One of the things is having a friend at work is one of the best ways to sort of retain people and so making these connections in sort of a, a whimsical, fun sort of way uh, really can help the health of the organization and help with retention and just overall morale. A lot of teams get siloed and when they're supposed to be working together and so if you have had this kind of interaction in a game setting with somebody, then you actually have to work with them. It's going to be a different initial meeting. Um, and Ishii's been great because it's sort of subtly connected people who would not normally be connected. And so now people from different disciplines and different teams who may or may not work together regularly now have a different connection. We found some interesting patterns across both weeks that as the week went on, we would get more and more players uh, and more connections uh, throughout the week, which I thought was really fascinating that people who didn't necessarily have the initial uh, call to play would see their teammates achieving things uh, and would receive messages or emails asking them to play and finally would come out and would begin playing. With Ishii, we're trying to lay the foundation of a new form of new employee orientation. And I wish we could do it all the time because it's to give something that you're doing that's not, that breaks up the day a little bit and gets people to interact. And So the opportunities for doing something like Ishii here at Microsoft are actually pretty tremendous. Um, not only is there a lot of amazing hardware literally embedded in the walls, um, but uh, I found a lot of people very receptive to the whole idea and experiment. We wanted to encourage employees to create their own culture and do things not because they're getting some points or an achievement, but because it's meaningful to them in a, in a more intrinsic way. The challenge of running a game in the workplace is that it is a place of work and whatever you do can't get in the way of that. If management was like on board, um, I think I would play. I like games. 
are, you know, if you're playing a first-person shooter game and, you know, you're trying to get the new weapon or level up to a, a new suit of armor, you know, it's akin to, okay, I'm doing my job to get to the next level or to get to the next title or to get to the next role. And so integrating some of those and, and taking what we learn in digital games and applying it to the workplace can only help with engagement. Cool. Well, okay. Well, let's I, keep going. Yeah. Fun. Great. Uh, so that, like I said, is a rough cut of uh, a little bit of our interview footage as well as kind of our higher goals. So hopefully that gives you a good idea. Uh, but just to reiterate, what some of our design initiatives were going into the experience is to make it uh, replayable so it was something that could be experienced again and again and focusing on game mechanics. Uh, that was a collaborative and increasingly collaborative as time went on uh, and grew in complexity in that regard uh, and really gave ownership to the players so that it didn't feel like it was a story that we were telling that they were uncovering but was something that they were doing and they could take ownership of. Um, and then some of the constraints, um, which uh, is something that's actually very important to game design is constraints, because when you don't have constraints, you can design anything. Um, so it's important to know what you're kind of designing towards. So we had a really tough balance between voluntary versus invo involuntary. Uh, as we mentioned, games are always voluntary. You can opt into a game or opt out. Uh, work is not necessarily as voluntary. Um, so if you have to do work, you have to do work. And the balance between game and work was something that we were always playing with. Um, another issue is that we were kind of trying to create as small a footprint as possible. Um, we were really lucky to have Ross Smith, who's the director of Test at Skype, to um, be a huge support for us there. But I wouldn't say this was a, an official project. You know, it was kind of... Uh, a bit cloak and dagger, so to speak. So we were trying to put this game and run this meaningful game in the workplace without really disrupting people. Um, again, and then another issue was uh, the Skype and Link merger and trying to figure out which technology would be best for reaching uh, everybody in both buildings, um, being that some people were more likely to use Skype and more, some people were more likely to use Link, and then figuring out when and where to use those two technologies. Uh, Excuse me. And then um, figuring out a mechanic in which somebody who only played for five seconds a day uh, felt like they were making a meaningful contribution, and somebody that was playing for uh, 30 minutes a day felt like they were making a meaningful contribution. So being able to allow both of those to be helpful. Um, and then finally, uh, I've mentioned Ross Smith a couple of times. This is um, a table from one of his papers, The Future of Work is Play, which I recommend you all check out. Um, so this, core, this table is looking at um, what kinds of games are most successful in the workplace. And um, the, in his studies, Ross has found that the most successful ones are ones that have to do with learning skills that have to do with your job, um, or what's called core skills um, that are not related to your job. And by core skills, it means um, things that you might do that are less than what you actually do for your job. So um, getting up, moving around, answering emails, playing games, it's, you know, it's not necessarily part of what makes your job unique. Um, so I would say that Ishii, uh, with its connections, breakthroughs, and bolts, definitely falls into this category. Um, and the other interesting thing to note here is that jobs that have to do with unique skills to the job, uh, excuse me, games that have to do with these unique skills uh, are traditionally um, failures because uh, if people feel like they're being successful in those games, then maybe they think they deserve a promotion. And if they're not doing well in the game, then maybe they're worried about their job. Um, so the kinds of games that work in the workplace, it's not all kinds of games. And so these are the kind of areas that are traditionally focused upon. OK, so just a quick review of the mechanics that we went over in the video. Um, so the individual actions were connections that involved swiping your badge uh, at these different stations. There were two stations for each floor of the two buildings. Um, and when you did a connection, you either got just a thank you message from the buildings, either Ingrid or Ingmar, or it asked you to answer a few questions about yourself. Um, once a team had done enough connections to reach a breakthrough, which was um, somewhere between four and 10 connections. Um, 
they would get these breakthroughs, which, uh, as again mentioned in the video, they kind of rose in complexity over time. Um, so it started off with just single connections and then rose through increasingly collaborative efforts till uh, we were hoping to get to these more interesting things where they had to answer questions about their teammates to figure out which ones had to go to stations or find objects together and then ultimately create media together. Um, so uh, in the actual app, they could look at the, the leaderboard to tell every time they'd been moved up. Um, and then again, there were bolts. So this is an example of a bolt right here where every bolt they received had a negative and positive charge, as we called it. So they could do something that positively impacted their team and potentially another team or negatively impacted another team. And that was a choice that they had to make. Um, and so all of these messages about breakthroughs and bolts were received by every member of the team via link. Um, and so, yeah. So just a really quick note on onboarding, which was the week-long process before the actual game. Um, so we placed these posters across the two buildings, um, which we were really lucky to have an awesome graphic designer to put together these kind of communist propaganda posters that said either EC can access or it's just fun and games. Uh, and I think we found that pretty quickly we had gotten total coverage uh, just from those posters. We put them in front of all of the doors. Uh, and really quickly, a lot of people uh, were asking just what Ishii was. And, you know, in that regard, it was a success. So here you can see uh, three different places that it was up around the buildings, near the kitchens, near the doors, uh, and then uh, in high traffic areas. And then we also put up these onboarding stations. Um, so people would see the our Ishii logo going up and down on this uh, tablet. And then if they swipe their badge, which it told them to do, they could say yes or no if they wanted to know more information about it and then get signed up to learn more about it. So that was kind of our main onboarding uh, process. And we found that we had about 100 people sign up. But, um, you know, and also just uh, we had to further our awesome graphic design help, uh, our design a logo, and then we designed a hat and uh, jumpsuit. So we were kind of walking around the buildings in these jumpsuits, and uh, I think I was referred to as jumpsuit guy for a long time afterwards. Um, and so we, had, we actually even had a ukulele player come and kind of create more mystery. But we found at this point, like, the, the Ishii buzz had saturated. People were already wondering where Ishii was. Um, so we had people come by our office wanting to know more. We would give them stickers or different promotional materials. Um, but we kind of had different reactions to this process. Um, so this is really cool. This was some fan art that was done during the first, um, during the onboarding week. Um, so you can see the, the Ishii logo here in the distance as Skype link, making connections, and they doing it with the Skype and link logos, which was really cool to us that people, that you know they got it uh, on a higher level, even if they didn't actually know what Ishii was at that point. So, you know, people were intrigued, but there was a lot of different reactions. Um, some people really got into that mystery and were really excited by it, which was really cool. Um, some people saw the posters, wondered what it was, and just out of, my, out of sight, out of mind. And uh, two weeks later, they still had no idea that Ishii was even running. Um, some people were scared to join. They just felt nervous about it. Um, some people were really intrigued, but really annoyed that we wouldn't tell them what it was. <laughs> so, you know, did we reach our target audience is a big thing that I've been thinking about afterwards because, um, you know, as I mentioned earlier, people play games for a lot of different reasons and mystery and whimsy is not uh, the reason for a lot of people. It is for some people, um, but this kind of mysterious background and onboarding process is something that's very popular in ARGs. Like I mentioned, the beasts and I love bees. It was all about this mystery and this thing that you uncovered. Um, and not to take away from that, but I, I wonder if we had been more explicit about some of the things we had done, if we had actually would have gotten a lot more people that would have been interested in this collaborative team-based game um, and know that it wasn't something that was potentially dangerous or weird or et cetera. Um, so I think if, if I could do one thing about the onboarding different, I would just 
try to find a way to let people know a little more clearly what the game was. Um, and to temper that, you know, we were in this difficult position that, you know, Donald said to me, there is a, point, a possibility that somebody could ask us to take all of this down day one. Um, so we were in this tough point of trying to find a way to get people interested and motivated without being in people's faces. Um, you know, and like I said, uh, I think we got about, we got 100 people to sign up. To me, I think the buildings hold roughly 500 people, and based off of walking around, it seems like there's probably three or 400 people uh, in the buildings right now, especially over vacation time. Um, so this, you know, that's a reasonable percentage to be catching. Um, okay, so looking at the actual results of the experiment, um, just to reiterate, our original objective was a two-week experiment uh, where players are randomly assigned to teams of strangers to compete. Um, so when they came in the first day, I sent an email at the beginning of the first day telling them to come by and receive their package to help them explain what this game was, since they didn't know at that point. Uh, and they got packages that looked like this. And inside um, was uh, a sheet with the rules and a letter, uh, a big plastic colored letter, uh, which I told them that they had to hang on to because it would come into the game later. Uh, and there was also a sticker involved. And we created um, DLs uh, so that the teams could communicate via email and link. And then we just told them to figure it out and have fun. Uh, I tried really hard not to be explicit about go do this, go do X or Y and Z. Um, and you know, I, brought a, I threw this up with rewards because ultimately, uh, like we mentioned in the video, we were looking for a meaningful game that has intrinsic rewards. So here are a few pictures of what the actual rewards were in the game. Uh, a foam rubber cow skull with uh, our logo driven, drawn on in marker. Um, lanterns, bags, um, wooden ducks with stickers on them. Uh, so people were not playing this because they were going to get uh, gift certificates or, you know, external rewards that were of value. There were, our rewards were essentially um, trinkets that had to do with the game and enjoying the game itself. Um, so in looking at the results, people liked it. That was really, really cool. It's really scary as a game designer to put a game out there and know that people might not like it. And people played which was also very cool. This is a picture of two different teams. Uh, you can't see the station, which is back here, but both of these teams are trying to coordinate um, a breakthrough at the same time at different stations. So they both needed two people at the station at the same time, uh, and they both had to be at the same station randomly. Um, so that was a big reward. Um, you know, there's a lot of things I would do differently, which we'll get to in a second, but we had players, and that was a big relief. Um, you know, at first people were really curious about what Ishii is. Um, this message got sent out uh, at, you see, at 11 on the first day. 729 was our first day. And so this was kind of, like I said, whenever a team got a breakthrough challenge or a bolt, uh, a, a link message would get sent from the Ishii account to all of the players. And see, you can see here all of these people for the first time getting this message and then email, uh, link messaging back to Ishii, wondering what the heck Ishii is. Um, so people were really curious to get in to figure out what was going on. Um, but you know, pretty quickly they began to organize um, and to figure out what the goal was and how that goal had to be achieved. And, um, and more players, you know, we started off, I said we had 100 people come in and say they were interested. But we would get more players both weeks as we went on. Um, people asking to sign up because they would see their, either people in their neighborhood or their friends um, you know, achieving things. So this is an email that was sent out after the first team got uh, you know, the trophy of the game, which was the Horns of Ishii. So he's sending an email out to his whole team, letting them know. And then a couple of guys from his neighborhood wanted to join up subsequently from that. And at its height, uh, we had eight employees simultaneously collaborating, collaborating on achieving the next breakthrough. So they had two people at four different stations across the two buildings, which is, you know, 
it's a pretty, that's a very difficult amount of people to coordinate. Um, and so the, for the first week, just to be clear, on all of these DLs, I had also put our account, so I was able to kind of monitor a lot of the communication just by being a part of that group. So I could see these, um, the emails as they were sending out, the link messages and stuff. So people use Link, people use Skype, people use Outlook, they even use Yammer to try to come together and figure out how to collaborate. So you know, we gave them a couple of those tools um, for them to be able to do that, and we just let them figure it out by themselves. Um, so, and then again, speaking to the idea of trying to teach them about the neighborhoods, you know, the first couple of times people engaged with um, breakthroughs that told them they had to go to a specific station, they were completely confused as to what stations were, uh, what these things meant, because a lot of people in the buildings only knew the name of their neighborhood. So they knew they, li they were in motorsports or cloud room or off ramp, but they didn't know that sit and spin and weathered wall, et cetera, existed. Uh, and what we found was that teams actually made cheat sheets that told them about all the different um, neighbors in the area. These are two different teams. They made a physical cheat sheet that they passed out to their teammates. And uh, this one sent an email to everyone just letting them know where all the neighborhoods were. Um, and um, this is actually my favorite picture. This is a picture of an asset. Uh, senior you actually in a principal GPM uh, collaborating for uh, and showing off their trophy. And the thing that I actually like about this picture the most is that they asked me to take it. It wasn't me documenting it. They were proud and they sent this out to the Edison's list, you know, showing that their team uh, had taken the horns of Ishii back. Um, so this is, I think, you know, proof of the fact that a game can create that culture between teammates who exist, who None of these people even knew each other before the game started. Uh, and they're proudly taking a picture together. And I think that really speaks to the employee engagement that we got from the people that played. And uh, yeah. Uh, so we had had a really strong first week, and then we had a problem. Uh, you know, being in the middle of the summer and just talking to some of my players, because Whenever there was a small bug going on, people would pop by if they had an idea about the game. People would often come by the Ishii office. Um, and just talking to my players, I found that um, roughly a third of our core players at the end of week one were going on vacation for week two, um, which was kind of a lot. So we, try, we thought about it, and we were trying to figure out a way to make the game sustainable. Because the problem was we had really um, made our design we tried to beat it out for a two-week ex experience. And when you're balancing a game, you know, those numbers, and they're, they're really tricky to figure out, especially because it was a bit of a guessing game because we couldn't play test it. Um, so even though we had designed it to be a two-week experience, we decided that we would rerun our one-week game because the idea of the replayability allowed for that. So we came up with this new challenge that would be organized by the neighborhoods, um, the wings that they um sat in, in the buildings. And rather than create uh, DLs again to really help them out, we said, OK, this time you're on your own. We're not giving you tools. You guys have seen it a little bit. You figure it out. And we also said that if you don't want to experience, uh, we made them tell us that they wanted to continue playing the second week. So if they didn't tell us what neighborhood they were part of, they were no longer part of the experience, um, which was really interesting because um, you would expect all of your top players to continue playing, the people that have done the most connections. But we actually found that there was a lot of people who had only made, say, one connection, two connections, three connections the first week that still really wanted to keep playing, um, which really speaks to the fact that something like this can engage a lot of people, even if they're not directly involved in the gameplay. So it uh, can improve the workplace culture and environment just by the awareness of it uh, rather than the specific playing of it. So. This is, our, uh, this is our trophy the second week. Um, well, the seashells were an additional touch not made by me. Um, but we found that the second week, when players had to mobilize their own coworkers, um, some rose to the challenge and some didn't. So we had a slight drop off in gameplay versus the first week, but we still had a pretty high level. Um, and so it was really, I, I don't have as much um, documentation of it because I wasn't a part of DLs because as far as I know, they didn't exist. I didn't create them. 
Um, but we definitely saw a lot more coordination. And when people are working from the same neighborhood, oftentimes that can be non-digital communication to get things started. Um, so just looking at some of the numbers, uh, these are kind of our high-level numbers from the two weeks. So just that connection of getting up, swiping your badge. We had 2,357 in total, um, 1,395 of those the first week, and a little less the second week. Uh, this is kind of, we did this chart of our connections by the hour. Um, and so what we found is that we had a, a lot of, a little spike around uh, lunch. And then usually we'd have big spikes around uh, the afternoon and towards the end of work. So kind of like tea time, uh, tea time players, if you will. Um, breakthroughs, the leveling up, this collaborative act that you'd have to do. We had 93 the first week and 61 the second week. Uh, and then bolts, you can see we had 20 the first week and 11 the second week. And this is a distribution of days. So we had a couple of days that got a little crazy. Um, and just to clarify really quickly on bolts, it was every time uh, somebody made a connection, they had a 1 in 20 chance of getting given a bolt. So, um, so the amount of players, we had 58 players in total. Uh, we had 43 the first week and 31 the second week. And obviously there's some overlap of people that kept playing the first week, and then new players the second week as well. Um, and we found that uh, our players, if you're familiar with distribution laws, you know, we had our high players up here, and then we had our fall down to a lot of players who made a, just a few connections over time, um, which is pretty similar to um, what you would expect from a distribution of players and how much different people are committed to it. Um, so I did a... Uh, a quantitative and qualitative survey that I sent out to all of the players at the end. And so I just wanted to share with you all some of the feedback from that. Um, so we found that pretty definitively people learned a lot about, le felt they learned about the buildings. Um, we got pretty good feedback about that. Um, so there's an interesting thing about the people, I feel like looking at the people who filled out this survey, the ones that played a lot, um, felt like they got a lot out of the games, and the people who didn't play that much but still fill out, filled out the survey didn't feel like they got much out of the game, which is where you'll see some of the people uh, who filled out the survey didn't really play that much, and so they didn't really feel like, you know, they met new people because they didn't, <laughs> they didn't really play as much. Um, and that's something that we kind of see across the board with playing Ishii and enjoying Ishii. Um, by and large, positive. Um, I would say we'll get to this a little bit more later, the question of the distract from work. Uh, and you can see that's roughly the same uh, as the people that enjoyed it. <laughs> so uh, it was definitely balanced in a way that it took too much time from the workplace. And that is actually probably a fault. It's not probably a fault. It is a fault of mine as a designer, um, which I'll get to later. Um, people seemed, again, divided about the length of the game, and I think that this also spoke to people who didn't really engage with it, but people that did. Uh, and we find that as well with people seeing themselves playing it over a long period of time. Some people were really interested in that, and some people were not interested in that. Um, so, you know, I think the interesting thing when I'm summing up not just the quantitative but the qualitative data is that people just wanted more from it. You know, they were really excited by the potential. Uh, one of the things that, just to summarize kind of the bigger, the broader trends of the qualitative data that I got, people really enjoyed collaboration, meeting new people, playing with their teams, achieving in that fashion, which is, you know, great because that was one of our huge goals. Um, people wanted the game to be more complex. Uh, they wanted to get to those points of, you know, answering questions, making media. They wanted to solve puzzles. They wanted it to be richer than just signing in at stations. Uh, and that's great. I really wanted it to be richer than that, too. Um, and this was a really interesting point. People kind of wanted a smaller footprint option that was like, hey, I'm really busy right now. I don't want to be getting an IM telling me that this is happening right now. I don't want to be getting five or 10 emails in the course of five minutes when I'm really busy. Uh, you see, you know, it's almost like they wanted like a mute button on the game for when uh, they had the call of work. Um, and you know, speaking again to the mystery 
some people wanted a little bit clearer goals and why people should play to help incentivize others, um, which is understandable when a tough balance because we kind of wanted the game to get richer and not tell them everything that was going to happen. Um, but people genuinely reacted very strongly towards the mystery and the branding. So, you know, looking at these points together, it's, yeah, it's a tough balance to find. And we didn't quite find it, um, but there was a lot of positive points. You know, and it, it's actually, you know, as a designer, you get these things where people will say, I want it to be more complex. I want a smaller footprint option. I want clearer goals. That's great because you want to have bad feedback. Um, because I think that ultimately it speaks that people wanted more from the experience. Uh, and, you know, this was an experiment that we had such a short amount of time to run. And when I look at this feedback, I see people wanting it to be more meaningful than it was. Uh, and that's something that I can agree with. And I think that that speaks well to what it could potentially be in the future. Um, so here's just kind of a set of my conclusions and things that I learned. Um, so we had a really difficult time because it's very difficult to play test something like this because you don't have all the players running around or predict the amount of players that we were going to have. Um, so I think we had on the, f on the fourth day of the first week, the teams had pushed past where we had play tested beyond, and then bugs started <laughs> happening because we just had not had that option to kill those bugs. Um, Therefore, your design, specifically like looking at the database, needs to be as adaptable as possible. And uh, Andy Lim, our designer, did a great job of making that design as you know, adaptable as possible. So things that we needed to tailor immediately as the game came up uh, could be. For example, from that 100 players that we started with, we initially had 10 teams of 10. I just divided them into the 10 teams. Uh, and then on the first day, it became really clear that the amount of players that we had playing that were core we needed to have less, fewer teams so that people could collaborate together. So in the first day, we were able to switch from 10 teams to four really easily. Um, so this was a really difficult one and what I was talking about earlier. I really wanted people to play my game. Uh, I was really frightened that nobody would play. Um, but a game that's successful in the workplace is not a game that people want to play all the time. And uh, I ended up balancing the numbers and skewing the design to incentivize more and more gameplay, as opposed to the amount of gameplay that might be more feasible to have run long term in a workplace. Uh, for example, we had this uh, rule set in that after your team got to a certain level, there would be a, an amount of time that you would have to wait between connections. Uh, and initially, the smallest number was five minutes, and then it would go to 10, and then it would go to 15. Uh, and I got super scared the first day because there wasn't a lot of play, and I dropped that number down to one and two. So it's just like, please play my game. Um, but as some of the players pointed out, that super incentivized people that could just play as much as possible for their teams to win. And it was not really a game about skill and creation and, you know, it was about collaboration in terms of getting time, getting timed events together, but it wasn't about collaboration in terms of making things together or thinking about Skype and Link together, or, you know, some of the ideas that we had, like they would, they would have to create something with Legos or just take pictures and make media. Uh, we missed out on some of those richer things, and, um, you know, part of it was there and part of it I wish it hadn't there, but. As a game designer, you have to look past your desire for I want as much play as possible for this to be successful to what is that workplace game that is successful? What is the best game that's meaningful in the workplace? Um, and to bring up a point that I brought up again, just because employees aren't playing doesn't mean that they aren't involved. And uh, we saw that there was a lot of positive engagement from people even if they weren't actually playing the game. Uh, people aware of it, people wanting to stay involved, you know, uh, that had never made more than one connection. So I found that to be a really positive and rewarding experience that you don't need to play to benefit from this experience. Um, and then, so like I said earlier, we had created this two-week experience, but some of the initial Signal Hill initiatives and some of our goals for the experience were really long-term ideas. 
Uh, and then we were trying to put them into a two-week experience. Um, and some of the stuff kind of was a jumble in that regard. You know, the answering questions about yourself was really a long-term idea that we could provide rewards and um, create affinity groups based off, you know, if, every, if 10 people answered that they're uh, Van Halen fans, that was our go-to, was if they like Van Halen fans and they also liked cats, then we would put all the Van Halen cat fans in a room and have them figure out what they had in common uh, and then give them some kind of reward. Um, so answering questions about yourself was kind of a long-term design goal, and we kind of pigeonholed it into this design. So there's a big difference between what a long-term Ishi looks like and a one-week Ishi looks like, and the design that we had here was kind of borrowed from both of those, I think. Um, it was really hard to run Ishii by myself, and I really want your sympathy and understanding. <laughs> Because uh, we, were, you know, we had these old tablets that would uh, you know, kind of flake out every once in a while. And um, you know, I was really lucky I had an awesome developer in Andy Lim. And you know, I couldn't give him all the stuff that I needed to give him in order to get all of the right design to the app, necessarily, or you know, to make sure that I was there for everything. Um, so, I think you know you kind of need two game runners for this. We needed a little bit more team support to kind of pull this off. It was uh, a very exhausting experience from my side during the actual experience because I felt like I couldn't leave because potentially um, one of the card readers were very uh, inclined to fritz out, so they had to be uh, woken up again. So I felt like I could never leave, which was a tricky thing. And hopefully, if we have better tech. Um, in the next version, that is not really going to be a problem. Um, but you know, that being said, we did do a lot of good database design and the infrastructure for what we actually have to embed uh, for Ishii, if this went back into the Skype buildings or somewhere else, is actually pretty minimal. You know, the, uh, the stations that we set up was uh, an IKEA table and a tablet with two card readers. And uh, we could easily get rid of the terrible IKEA table. <laughs> Uh, and there would be a lot of other places where we could put them in. I was actually really surprised that people that were in the neighborhoods where we put our stations, um, nobody ever complained. When I went in there, people hardly even noticed me. Sometimes there was a little bit of ribbing, I, told, I was told. People would joke with other people about it. But um, you know, putting this into an area is not that hard. You know, it, it'd be pretty easy to install this anywhere. Um, you know, I, like I said, I think we would need another pass on the game design, the graphic design, and the development. Um, but, you know, if you've got two people just being aware of the game part-time, I think you could run this most anywhere on the Redmond campus. Um, so just to reiterate, um, I think that Ishii was really successful at making this, that hitting this like most impact core function, um, really benefiting workplace culture through the game. Uh, and the fact that we saw these people come together that didn't know each other from all of these different backgrounds in the company was really rewarding. Um, and as much as I would like to change and improve about the game, I think that um, we saw that it can be a success in this environment. And kind of finally, I'm just like really grateful uh, for Donald for bringing me here, just uh, and to be able to be given the opportunity to possibly impact so many people. Uh, just on the last day, I actually had a ton of players come by and just you know say thanks and wonder what about what the future was of Ishi. So you know, I think it really did positively impact a lot of people, and I feel really lucky to have that opportunity. Uh, and just in a final thank you. I'd like to thank Donald, who brought me here, Ross Smith, the director of Tessa Skype, who was like our big sponsor and helped us set that groundwork, and Andy, who was uh, my developer, and just, you know, <laughs> I would have been in a lot of trouble without him. And, uh, you know, I gave him, he made, he had to make a lot of, uh, figure out a lot of things just based off of stuff that I gave him that was not of enough information, and yeah, he did an awesome job. And then finally, to all the people that played Ishii, because uh, 
you know, Ishii was designed to exist through them, and it did, and they did a lot of awesome things. Uh, so, yeah, that is Ishii. Um, so now I'll open it up to any questions that you guys have. Questions? <laughs> We have a captivated audience. Okay. Um, I have a question for you. Okay. You played a lot with infrastructure, uh, with with doing um, using employee information in some ways. Um, did you run into any issues with using that data? And are there other aspects of the data or ways you could use employee data? Do you think to enhance the experience? Um, well, we. In all of our messaging, we told them up front that we wouldn't be giving our data to anybody else. We wouldn't be showing anybody else in the company like X, Y, and Z about them. Um, we, we didn't take a whole lot of information from them. We just used their alias and their email. Um, and we were trying to learn more things like in terms of uh, you know, their favorites and things that they like so we might provide them with a richer experience. Um, you know, it'd be interesting how much, like, if this got integrated, if you could involve it with people's calendars to know when it might be better for them to sync up or something like that. Um, I think if uh, a company or organization afforded that opportunity, it could help make things more customized and personal um, in a way that didn't seem like it was invading somebody's privacy. Great. Uh, so I want to thank everyone who came out to uh, to, to hear the talk. Um, I want to thank everyone else out in Internet land, uh, present and future, for uh, listening and learning about what we're doing. Uh, you can reach out to me or to Abhiman if you have more questions. Uh, and yes, a special thanks to Andy for uh, for helping out with the engineering and for Ross, uh, who is really our champion, who's been uh, for more than 10 years a champion of serious games here at Microsoft, the champion of serious games at Microsoft, and who made this possible. And uh, my final revelation, I'll reveal the Easter egg inside of, inside of Ishii that you've all been wondering about. Uh, many of you have seen this, this logo, and you uh, have probably, because we've talked about Signal Hill, um, and this is the Internet Signal Hill Initiative, so you might have heard that this is like the Signal Hill, and this is like the bolt, the, the radio transmission that Marconi sent. I'm here to tell you today that that's actually not true, that this is actually Ross Smith's skull. So, yes. And, uh, and, uh, it's, and that Ishii is the idea that, that sprang from his head like uh, Athena from the head of Zeus. So, with that, thank you all very much, and thank you, Abhiman. Um, you're really freaking fabulous. I'm really pleased. So, uh, yeah.